Holy Trian, God, dear Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for this day and, and, and the possibility to be together here as a Christian, attending this conference and learning more about you and, 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 and your word. And we pray that you would bless and guide our session today and give us all the wisdom we need to discover your will in, in these difficult questions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, hello. And uh, my, yeah, wel welcome, come in. So uh, I'm happy to see all of you. I honestly didn't know how many, many people were interested in, in, in discussing celibacy. I, I was, in my mind, I was going that are we going to be 15 or 120. But, but this, this is a good, good group. And, 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 and yeah, you're, you are most welcome, every one of you. We, with us being so few here, I think we have, have the possibility for more questions and more, more, more also dialogue. Uh, if, if you so want to, I can also, also speak. I'm, I'm sorry about the heat. It's, it's really, really hot. I, unfortunately, I can't help but we, we try to open the doors and that's about, that's about what we can do. That. So, um, my name is Sebastian Grunbaum. I'm from Finland. I've been there a pastor for 11 years. I was ordained in 2011, and then the last two years I've been studying in St. Louis at Concordia Seminary. I'm doing a PhD about Chemnitz. That's probably not why they chose, chose me to speak here. I, I think it, it was because I'm good friends with Samuli Sika Virta, who is the chairman of the conference. That, that, that's why I, I got invited, but, but, but it, it, it's fun, fun to be here with you. So I thought we have about one hour and, and 15 minutes, all, all in all, and uh, feel free to ask questions in, in the middle. I also tried to leave some room in the, at the end for discussion, but the truth is that it almost always goes like this, that we don't have any room for discussion at the end. So, so if you have a question, please, please feel, feel free to ask. I, I thought that we would start in a sort of simple way. and. Um, uh, I was, I was thinking that, oh, hello, just yeah, be bold and, and come, come and sit, sit down, find a place. Uh, I thought that we would start this session in a little bit of an unorthodox way. I thought that I would tell you something about me, because um, one of, of my teachers, Robert Kolb, he's a very renowned Luther scholar, and he, he used to have this mantra mantra that stuck with me, he used to say this all the time in class, and, and the mantra was that all theology is autobiographical, meaning that every single theologian, uh, when they live their life, no matter where they're born or what context they are in, they are not isolated studying the Word of God, they're alone, but they are always interacting with a lot of things. And um, they, they are born into a particular church in a particular historical situation, and they wrestle with particular <laughs> theological questions and problems, and that affects the way they think and what they look at in the Bible and how they read church history and all, all things. And when it comes to marriage or celibacy, it, it most certainly affects people how they, how they yeah, what, what they have experienced. So in, in my case, my, my presentation be, will be very different from someone who met the love of their life when they were 16 and got married when they were 19 and have six kids by their age, they are 35. That, 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 that's not my story. I'm almost 39 and, and I, I'm not desperate or anything. This is not that kind of a story, but I've lived being married, um, I've dated a couple of times in my 20s. Then at some, some, some point I, I got really bored with dating. I, I didn't want to date anymore. Um, I felt like, felt like that became a little bit too difficult for me. Uh, and it, it wasn't because I sort of discovered that there, there was no sort of great revolution. I, I just started to feel like my life was more peaceful without dating, that, that dating actually made my life more difficult than, 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 than being alone. And, and after that, I simply said that, God, 
If you want to give me a wife, I'm open. If not, that's good as well. That, so that, 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 that's where I come from. And, and so, so it, it is very different, again, compared to someone who has been married for 20 years when they are 40. But I think it might also be a blessing. I've, I've learned actually, instead to feel, of feeling sorry for myself, I've learned to cherish that because this is the experience of quite many of you probably here as well. Uh, not all of you, many are 20 still, but, but there are uh, many, many of you who are, are, are on the better side of 30, maybe even on the better side of 40. And, 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 and you, you, have the, you shared the same experience with me and, and I, I, I feel truly blessed that I, I can talk, talk to you from a position where I'm in, I'm, I'm, I, I, I sort of know at least a little bit of what you have experienced and what you might experience. So uh, let's start quite simply from, I, I sort of wrote here that the problem we're trying to solve, sorry, I'm trying to find my mouse here. And so what we did, what, what happens is our historical context and especially like as Lutherans, we, we come from a, a very particular context. And one of the most revolutionizing things during the Reformation was the concept of marriage. So before the Reformation, marriage was some, uh, or celibacy, being single, being living alone was somewhere here, and marriage was somewhere here. And that was sort of the basic thing. And then during the Reformation, a switch happened so that it went like this. So it ba basically, practically, for all practical purposes, that the, 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 the reformers and all those who wrote about that started to, to, to talk about marriage as the best ever and, and celibacy as the worst, more, more, almost most miserable state ever. I, I'm going to read just, this is a, a, a scholar called Stephen Osman who has written a lot, lot and he, one of his books is called when fathers ruled family life in Reformation Europe. And he, he writes like this. The Protestant reformers were, how, how, however, the first in church history, like after, after, the, after Jesus or after Paul, uh, who, set, who set the family unequivocally above the celibate ideal and to praise the husband and the housewife over the monk and nun in principle. Repeatedly, one reads that God respects a marriage as much as virginity, that an unhappy marriage is preferable to an unhappy chastity, that celibacy, while more desirable than marriage for those few who can freely and happily maintain it, is a supernatural, supernatural gift that God really bestows. So that, that, that's the sort of bottom line. And Luther is, is no different. He's basically more or less the same. He writes somewhere that it's only one in thousand who can receive the who has the gift of chastity, who can remain somewhat sexually pure, and then later on he, he says says somewhere that it's only one in ten thousand. So, so for all practical purposes, it's it's impossible for, for in Luther's world, or seem, seems to be at least. Well, then if we go a little bit. Further in church history, we talk about a little bit more modern Lutheran theologians, again where we are coming from, it's still more or less the same. So we have, we have these guys who, who write, and, and I, I took three modern Lutheran exegetes, just so that you get the flash, because an and, and exegete is a fancy word for someone who studies the New or the Old Testament for a living, that, that's his, his job. And these exegetes, they are, they, are, so they, are, they are expounding the Bible and reading these large commentaries, or writing these large commentaries, also reading them, but writing. And, and what theologians do that is that if, if someone asks, uh, for example, me to have a Bible study or teach at Corpus Christi or whatever, the first thing I do is that I go to Accordance, which is an online or a program I have on my computer, where I have downloaded all these commentaries, and then I, I, I go and check all the Bible passages and what everyone else has said about this. So these, these guys influence me a lot. And especially if they are Lutherans, they influence Lutheran teachers and pastors a lot. 
So th this is what you sort of hear in or can hear these kinds of undertones if, if you talk about celibacy or, or virginity. So these are three guys. Uh, one is called Kretzmann, he wrote somewhere in, in, in 1922. He, he wrote, wrote like this. The situation in those days, during the times of Paul, 2,000 years ago, was much as it is today. Then, as now, the only way to, successful, uh, to be successful in fleeing fornication was in seeking the chastity in marriage. This is commentary on 1 Corinthians. So that, 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 that's what Kretzmann writes. Lenski, who wrote in the 1960s, writes, uh, or, in, in, or actually, I, I don't have a dire direct quote, but he interprets the idea of celib of Romans, oh, no, sorry, 1 Corinthians 7, and, and says that actually 1 Corinthians 7 is only written to the specific historical situation. Church of Corinth. It has nothing to do with the rest of the church at all. That, that's his interpretation. So, so when, when Paul writes about the gift of, of, of living alone and so forth, according to Lenski, that's sort of off the table. Let's, let's not talk about it. And then Lockwood, who talks about the, uh, the, the when you, you see that in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1, when, when Paul starts the letter that Regarding to those things that you wrote about, it is better for a man to live alone. Lockwood, who's this modern 2010, writ, he has written in 2010 in Concordia commentary. Lockwood writes that that it is better for a woman, for a man not to touch a woman. That's actually something that Paul quotes. So it's not Paul's own words, but Paul actually just reacts to something that the Corinthians have written to him. Go ahead, do you have a question? Oh, I was just saying, oh. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. So that, that, his idea is that, 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 that that's actually not Paul's idea at all. And then he goes on to explain that, that how, how, how Paul's idea is that, that you should definitely just get married. So, so, so and th this is, this is, this is Luther, modern Lutheran exegetes. And I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm saying this not because all their exegesis is bad, they write amazingly good stuff. But, but I'm, I'm saying it because what Luther thinks and what Luther's contemporaries think have influenced later Bible comment, uh, commentators like these guys that I just mentioned. And in turn, they influence the preachers and teachers, Lutheran pastors, who in turn influence you. So that, that's why I have never read a single book or even an article, I think, by a Lutheran author about celibacy. No, nobody has just written one. At least I, I haven't. There might be somewhere in some journal uh, an article of three or four pages, but, but, but I, I haven't read any like, sort of serious scholarly work or more serious approach. And at the same time, we are in this situation where 50% of the population in Finland and in the United States probably almost all over Western, uh, the Western Hemisphere, live alone. So in our congregations, basically, almost most of the people, I don't think they are that exceptional, it might be 45% in our congregations, but in our congregations, it is very likely, and my, my, at least my experience, is that quite many people live alone. And they are sort of just being ignored, I don't know, how, or not maybe ignored, they might have some encouragement that come on, get married, or do something about it, but, but, but there, there's, there's not a lot of like very serious theological effort to, to try to address this, that they, they live alone. Am, am I making sense so far? Everyone's following me. Two, two chilies is not too much yet. Yeah, good, good, <laughs> good. Just tell me if I'm not. I, I promise I'll try to explain. Okay, so the way I see it, because I, I, I think I might be the first one to sort of try to sketch out this uh, a theology of, of celibacy or a theology of, of living alone. And a celibacy means basically not to have, have sex with anyone. Uh, not ever, because you might meet someone in the future, but not actively having, having sex with anyone, including yourself. So, so, so the, first, the first one, I, I might be the first one who actually tries to make some kind of theology out of this 
in a, on a, from a Lutheran perspective. So this is this is I'm I'm just trying something, and, and you're you're my sort of how how do you say this? What, what? Guinea pigs, yes, precisely. Thank you. So and, and please so please do give feedback, and I'll, uh, let's see see where 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 we land. So I think that there are two two kinds of people who 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 live live alone. Uh, and uh, there are those who have chosen, so this is number one, those who have chosen to live alone for the sake of the kingdom of God. Do we have anyone among us who have done that? Or has anyone made that this choice? Well, most of you probably didn't know that this choice even existed, but, 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 <laughs> but, but yeah, so, so th there are those, and those who are single by default. That is, or those are people who maybe don't want to be single, but have not found a spouse, a spouse, are divorced, are widowed, or something else can, for some maybe medical reasons, something else can, cannot get married. So I'm going to start with number one, and just to sort of present to you what I think is a biblical view of it, and the, 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 to choose to live um, single for the sake of the kingdom of God. It's also a Lutheran view, actually, because I, I found this in some of the Lutheran, fathers of the Lutheran Orthodoxy. It's not spoken of a lot, but I found, found, found this there. So, uh, and, and also, it, it's very clearly in the New Testament. So I'm, I'm going to start with that, and then, then I'm, I'm going to uh, say something about option two, that is to be, be single by, by default as, as well. Okay. So, the first question is, who can choose? So now Paul, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, it's 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 9, he says that, uh, that for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. And that, that's, so then the question becomes that what is burning? And this is how Thomas of Aquinas and Martin Chemnitz answered the question. I, I think it's, it's a pretty interesting answer. So he, he says, says like this, He who feels the warmth, warmth does not at once burn. But when, in the celibate life, that the titillations of con concupiscence, sorry, this is a hard word, so that means concupiscence means that you have the desire, an evil lust or bad desire for, 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 for sex, that prick you with their needles and you feel a, a certain amount of heat, you are not to shout at once that you are burning, but are to repul repulse it bravely with diligence, effort, fight, temperance. You are to oppose to it the fear of God and the love of true modesty, to cut off the unclean thoughts, repress foul I impulses, shun opportunities, and pray that, th that strength may be given to you, you by the Lord to resist. And if the flames of lust can be suppressed, repelled, or extinguished by this diligence, you are not yet suffering the burning of which Paul speaks. But this precisely is the gift of continence, that is, that this diligence in fight is accepted by those who ask, is awakened, cultivated, and preserved. If, however, the flames of lust are so hot that they cannot be suppressed, extinguished, or repelled by this diligence, according to the saying, the more the fire is pressed back, the hotter it grows. But penetrate inward, capture the will, inflame the heart, carry off the thoughts, and set the whole bo body on fire, so that the heart is hot and burn either with full assent or with a blind and restless unrush of lust. Then it is certain that you are not able to receive the saying of Christ that this, that you do not have, that is, that you do not have the gift of continence from God. So what they're basically saying is that sometimes people have different kinds of temptations. And so you might, might feel a lust, a desire for the opposite sex, or you might, might have some sort of thought that is sexual. But this does not in itself still mean that you're burning with desire, burn, burning as what Paul, Paul, Paul speaks here. It only, only that only means that you're sort of you're being you're being tempted. No, it's it's Thomas of Aquinas. Oh, okay. Yeah, but good, good, and it's quoted quoted again by Martin Chemnitz, who's a 
father of the Lutheran Orthodox, Orthodoxy. So it's, it's not only, on, only, only Catholics, but also Lutheran theologians that this is, think that this is a, a good way of thinking, it, uh, thinking about it. So, so they're saying that, that, yes, you might feel some temptation, but that doesn't really mean that you're still burning. You, you, so you can, you can sort of... If you, if you, and, and then the, the key is that can you fight it off? That, can you, that is, can you, can you in prayer and through Christian, Christian diligence calm yourself down? And, and then if you can, that's fine. Continue your life. And if not, then it's better to, to get, get married. And now it's important to note that, that Chemnitz is not saying it, or Aquinas is not saying it either, that if you can fight it all off, that means that, that, that you, you cannot marry. No, nobody is saying that. You can, you can always get married, no matter how much you have this gift or not. It's, it's not like, oh, I discovered that I have the gift of chastity, a.k.a. or continence, or I, a.k.a. I can never get married. It's not like that. You're, you're free to marry at any time. But the, the, the interesting thing with this is that if you discover that you have this gift, then it, it frees you in my mind, and I, I think that, that's the biblical way of thinking about it, because Jesus also says that it, it is given to those uh, to certain people, and they, so they can choose then quite sort of, how do you say, after consideration choose that, okay, I want to serve God with my whole life. I don't want to get married. That, that, and that, that's the king, uh, and I, I want to serve the kingdom of God. Okay, and now I have, um, I have this uh, uh, picture here behind you. Uh, I can't remember her name again, but she's the really cool elf uh, who fights in, ho in the Hobbit. Ho Hobbit. What, what's her name? Arian. Arian, yes, thank you. Thank you. And, and, and the reason why I, I chose her was that, 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 that they used to have something in the age, ancient church called church vir virgins. But that just sounds so lame. <laughs> so I, I, I thought that I will, I will, I will sort of rebrand it as church commandos. <laughs> they sort of su super soldiers who fight for the army of God. So, so, that, so that, that, that's why I chose, chose this picture. And, uh, and, and so I'm... I'm making an argument that why, why could you or why, why should you choose to live a celibate life, meaning to decide not to, not to marry? Well, first of all, both Jesus and Paul considered it a, it, it a better way of living. Like I, I, not many talk about this, but Jesus never married and there probably was a reason. And he could have probably remained without sin as well, even if he would have married. Right? But he never married. So there is a reason. It is easier. And Paul never marries, the greatest apostle in the history of Christianity. He never marries. And they both, uh, through their example, I think they, they demonstrate that there is something here. And um, more concrete examples, um, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 7 is that he says that when you don't marry, uh, you have freedoms from the anxieties of this world, meaning that you have more time. A person who is celibate can care for what belongs to the Lord instead of caring for his spouse. That is, devote himself to prayer and, and fasting and reading the Bible. A possibility to devote oneself to the work of the kingdom of heaven, that Jesus was word in Matthew 19. And also a typical one that also often is mentioned is that a celibate person is someone who looks more to the future life than this life. Because Jesus says that in heaven they will not get married, or the people will not marry or get married, but they will be like the angels. And you can imagine in a time like ours that's so soaked with sex everywhere all the time that what a testimony you can give to someone and say that no I actually chose not to ever have sex because of the kingdom of God that was my choice and I think that's one of the most powerful testimonies that you can actually give in an age like this because it's so countercultural. 
Well, there are also, are, are you following me this far before I continue? Yeah, everyone. Do you have any questions? Do I, am I making sense? Okay, good. Uh, there are also wrong arguments uh, or wrong reasons. Not, not wrong arguments, but wrong reasons. Uh, and, um, but I, I want to, because no one's asking questions, so I want to say something about these so-called church commandos. Uh, 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 that I, I, I'm thinking about. And I'm, I'm thinking about, like, if, if I think about just my own personal history, what it was like to be a pastor. Hey, come in. Don't be shy. Here's plenty of space. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yes. A low profile and everything, yeah. Uh, 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 so, uh, yeah, there is a... Uh, so, um, I, when I, I, I was a pastor for 11 years in, in Turku, in Finland. And, and, um, and, and what I did was I, my, my sort of special, speciality, how I, how I, what, what I did like mostly during my career was building new congregations. So that, 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 that's what I did. So I, I, I tended to find myself in a position where there was always people asking me that could you come and help us build a new congregation? And then I, I so I, then I, I helped them I, I'm no master in any, any way, but that, that just seemed to happen. And, and what I discovered was that during these projects, most of the time, it was people who were alone who were most helpful. And wh why, why is this? Because they have so much time. They, they can always come and, and, and sort of organize something, or they can come a Bible study or they can invite their friends that they have a lot. They have a, often a bigger social circle, especially if you have small children, they, they consume all your time and your energy. And, and then, then may, maybe if you are a really diligent parent, you have time to come to the Sunday service. But that, that's about it. But, but, but single people, they had so much more time and they, they've been so helpful in, in so many ways. And I, I could mention many of those, but but, but there, there was a time when, for example, the person who was responsible for coffee after church, she was alone. And then there was uh, the person who was responsible for music in church was one who was living alone. The one who was responsible for our, our ushers, ushers in church, those who organized the church space, he was the one living alone. And there, there were there was so, so many great blessings and, and benefits. Not to talk about all the hundreds and thousands of families and people who live right among us who really need support and they need help. And, and, and as, as single people, you have, you have that possibility. But why not then? Well, there are a couple of good reasons. Um, uh, so the, the, why, why, why not, not choose celibacy? One is simply for your own pleasure. So if you think like that, that, that okay, um, I want a life that is as easy as possible. I, I don't want to do anything. I just want to sit at home. I want to watch Netflix. I want to drink my beer. I, I, like that, that's it. I, I work maybe six hours a day the minimum, and, and get the minimum wage, and that's it. And then I live for myself. That's not a really good reason to choose the celibate life. Because celibate life, it's not about living for yourself. It's about living for God. It's about serving the, the congregation. It's about serving your neighbor. Uh, the second one is that if you are burning with desire and you feel it and you really struggle with it, and a suitable husband or wife comes along, then, then, you, then it's probably better to get married. It's, sort of, it, it's, sort of, it, it's not a very good thing that if you're like completely overwhelmed with lust, and then, then you're, you're wondering that what, what should I do with my life, and how should I be? And, and then, then someone comes al along that, that you think that, wow, she's, she or he is perfect for me, and then, then you go like, oh, but I already decided to be celibate. That, 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 that's, that's, that's not good. That then, then, then it's probably better, better to marry. And the third one is that all those kinds of silly rules that Christians have, or I think they are a little bit silly. Uh, 
one of them, which I remember very well, was that someone told me that if you're a Christian, you can't date one more than one person a year. And I, I, don't, I just don't understand that. But why couldn't you have coffee every month with a new person like if, if you're not promising them anything? And it's somehow like, that, don't, don't make it like more difficult for yourself than it has to be. That, that, that's what I'm, I'm saying. Okay, well, let's talk about celibate by default, which might be more interesting to some of you. So, uh, I, I put this quote from, uh, it's also, you see, I, I've been watching too much Lord of the Rings and, and Hobbit, but, <laughs> but, 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 but I, I somehow feel like this, this um, captures something of many, what many celibate people tend to think, especially Lutheran celibate people. And, and this, is, this is, so this is Gandalf and, 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 and Bilbo discussing, oh no, sorry, Gandalf and Frodo discussing, and, 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 and Frodo is a little bit depressed uh, with, with his situation, he being the ring bearer and all the forces of evil being after him. And then Gandalf says that, uh, or, or Frodo first says that, I, I wish I, I hadn't been born in a time like this. And, and then, then, then Gandalf answers that, so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. There are other forces at work in this world, Frodo, besides the will of evil. Bilbo was meant to find the ring, in which case you were also meant to have it. And this is an encouraging thought. So, what is difficult with this celibacy thing is like, and especially if, if it, you're celibate by default, that you just haven't found anyone or met anyone, is that it can be very painful. Uh, and I've seen this quite many times as a pastor. You, this is one of the more typical pastoral care con conversations I've had uh, with many, many younger and a little bit older persons as well. It could be anyone basically under 50. And, and, uh, and the great, one of the great disadvantages is that for people that are celibate by default is that, they, that it drains an enormous amount of energy and it makes often joyous times like holidays, birthday celebrations and other moments very painful. So you, you sort of, uh, you realize and, 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 and especially women tend to feel this very concretely that every, every birthday after 30 is worse or it's sort of, because it, it, it sort of, you, you start to start to think, think, or many, many, many tend to very think, think out loudly also that, that, that they, they sort of know that, okay, my, my body can have a child only so many years and, and, and now, now those years are going and, and, and that's, that's not, not fun. But it, I don't know if it's any much better for men. Obviously, you can say that as a man you can have a child by the age of 60, but who, who wants to be in the grave before your son turns 15? Like it's, so, uh, or, 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 or sit in a wheelchair when he graduates from high school. That, I, I think that that's also quite, it's not a very inspiring idea, at least, at least for me. Uh, uh, so I, I'm thinking that we have to just acknowledge this. It is painful and I don't know if we can do too much about it. Uh, I, I was reading this trauma book and I thought that I could do something about that uh, when thinking about what to say to someone who's, uh, who's uh, not met someone or who hopes to meet someone, but at the same time mourns that they, they, the years are going by and they, the plans that they had didn't work out. And uh, according to the trauma book, I'm, I'm now applying it, I'm not quoting or anything, but I'm applying it. And there it said that there are three ways of explaining why you haven't gotten married. So the first one is that there's something wrong with you, that, that I'm bad, ugly, unlovable, stupid, whatever you name it, something could be anything. The second way of explaining it is that uh, 
I have done the wrong things. I messed up my relationship. I sips. I, I didn't shower enough. I haven't a proper job. Uh, I don't know what, what, what kind of explanations you might have. Might, might be many, many different kinds. Um, and the third one is that God in his, in his infinite wisdom sometimes lets all kinds of really painful things happen to his children. And that's the third one. And what the trauma book was saying was that this third one is really difficult for people because we naturally want to make sense of things and we want to believe that the world is good. And I don't know if you ever heard, but I've heard quite many of these speeches where you have a 45-year-old, 50-year-old pastor who's been married happily for 30 years saying to younger guys or, or women that, that, why don't you just get married? Just take her. What's the matter with you? Type of thing. And, and, and it comes from a, a, a probably like a place of like genuine, that they really mean something well. But a big part of it is that when something has gone easily for you, then you actually tend to see the world. That, well, yes, the world tends to be good, or God tends to be good, and, and also, also it tends to make sense to you, and, 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 and that, that's why you have this. Well, just do it. Just, just go for it, and it will be, all be good. But the fact that it worked for you doesn't mean that it works for someone else, right? It, it might be like really, really difficult. And, and trust me, I've seen so many bad marriages that you, you don't want to go in, in that way that you sort of don't consider it or you sort of think that, well, okay, I have no other option. I have to take him or take her or, or some, something like that, 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 that usually doesn't end well. That it, there is a certain risk, but, but I wouldn't take that risk unless I would have carefully considered and thought about it. Who is this guy actually I'm going to marry? What kind of person is he? Is he reliable or, or not? And, and, and is he a Christian or not? Or um, does he have the same vision for the future? Now, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more tomorrow when we talk about marriage. But uh, If someone has to blame something, it is usually more useful to blame category number two. So it's more useful sort of if you counsel someone and someone has this en enormous blame of him or herself and then he goes that, that well, uh, I'm, 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 I'm to blame and I'm so bad and I'm so ugly and I'm so stupid and no one will ever love me. It's usually better to try to think more in terms of the second category and, and ask that, well, is there something you could be doing differently? And, and, and sort of, is there, and, and it, it's not, not to say that that, that finds, that, that that helps that person to get married. It, it might help, it might not. But what it does is that it gives the person some measure of control, feeling of control, instead of just feeling lost or drift at sea. But I think, that where we want to land and where we should sort of, all of us should land in the long run is explanation number three. That there are quite many of us who did the right things and uh, there was nothing like seriously wrong with us. Okay, well, in a sense, yes, we are all sinful and, and terrible and all those kinds of things, but we are not that much or we are, we are pretty much all, all human beings in the same boat. Like that, that most of us could look, look, look ourselves in the mirror and assess that, well, okay, I might be a little bit crazy in that, in that way or irresponsible in that way, but so, so is this guy who's married, or so is she who's married. And, and this goes like with all categories. It goes with, with looks, it goes with wealth, it goes with success, it, it goes with anything, that there, 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 there are always these, like, and you probably could raise your hands right now and say, well, I know someone who's really ugly, but he's happily married and he has five kids, or I, I, I know someone, <laughs> uh, or I, I, know, I know someone who's a complete idiot, but he's also married, uh, and, or I, I know someone who can't keep a job for more than three months, but, but he's married, like, you, you know, 
And so it, 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 that, that's just how it goes, that God, God, for some reason, he doesn't always lead it. It doesn't mean that we, 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 um, we sort of, um, how do you say, we, we, think, we would think that these, these people are, it's it just, yeah, I'm, I'm going to maybe formulate like this, that, that it is just the responsible thing, I think, to do in the long run is just to realize that there are some things that just don't happen and God doesn't give them to us. And that's just how life is. And then maybe in heaven we get an explanation. I hope, at, seriously, at that point, that I don't care anymore. I, I just, uh, I, 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 I think I, I want to just look at Jesus and be happy. But, 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 but you, you might, might get an explanation there. Hmm. In general, with trauma, and also I think this pertains very well to celibacy as well, is that it is those who survive best tend to be people who make something useful out of it. So in the, in the, in the trauma book that I was uh, listening to, and there was this example of, of, a, of a boy who had died at the age of 15, and he had died in, in that way that he had been riding a motorcycle without a helmet. And, and then, then the mom, mom obviously got the new, news, or family got the news, and they completely broke down. But what they did was that they started this campaign that was called something like, I don't know, wear your helmets for Klaus or whatever his name was, or for Billy, something like that. And, 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 and in that way, they made something positive out of it. And I, I've, I've seen the same thing with celibate people as well. Uh, not, I, I haven't seen Lutheran celibate people writing about this, but I've seen it in practice. I've, I've heard these stories that, well, I didn't get any kids of my own, but now I can spend more time with my nieces and nephews, for example. Or I, I didn't, I didn't have, 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 have children of my own, but now I can take care of the children in the congregation, th those kinds of things. And, 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 and I, I think, I think that, that's valuable to sort of think about, uh, again, if you're talking with someone or you might talking, be talking with yourself and you might sort of say, ask that, well, okay, that didn't happen, but what other things did it make possible for you? Well, how, 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 how could you sort of see some sort of a silver lining in this whole thing. What, what, did, what did this sort of enable you to do, for example, that, that a married person couldn't have done? And I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying that you can't mourn. You can be very sad about it and you can cry and you can, you can cry to other people also and, and you don't have to be all happy, happy, joy, joy. But I'm, I'm sort of just trying to point you in a direction that how could you sort of sustainably live with something like this, in case you don't get married, it's, it's a very pos big possibility that, that, that many of you don't get married in this room. And of those who get married, I don't know, probably a good 40, 50 percent will divorce at some point. So, so that, that, that's just what the statistics are telling me right now. And, and, and I, I didn't see any major difference in the congregation either. That it, it wasn't sort of that. Oh, they are Lutheran. That's a failsafe. That I, I'm 39, and uh, out of uh, out of the couples I've seen that that are married, like I, I've been to that wedding, out of them already a third have been divorced. That you just hear, hear these stories. Oh, they got divorced, and oh, they got divorced, and, and that that's just how, how it works. So it, I think it, it it is valuable to sort of contemplate, not not to be too depressing, but but just to be realistic that. This is what, what's going on, and, and, and as a church and, and, and congregation, we have to somehow find ways to talk about it and, 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 and deal, deal with it. Not that I want anyone to get divorced either, but just if you get married, stay married and be happy. <laughs> yeah, I have to protect myself. That no one. Okay. Then uh, there is also this question that do I really have to marry? I think it's a good question. To ask, uh, I know someone has asked this from me, or a couple of guys have asked that, do I really have to marry? Uh, I think this comes from a, a place where you're sort of in a double bind, so to speak. On the one hand side, you're feeling sexual temptation and lust, 
and the other hand side you can't find any woman or man who's, who, who's a suitable, who, suitable husband or wife. And then you're there in the middle because you, you, you choose the last way and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, sort of feel like if you, you don't get, if you don't get married, you feel like you choose the last way, which is obviously sinful and against the sixth commandment. And if you do get married, then you have to sort of sell out on your own values and choose someone that you really don't want to live with for the rest of your life and be miserable there. So uh, I'm going to read you a quote from the Confessions. I know that there's some theologians here. This is one of the uh, reasons why I, I, I put two chilies, because then I get to read from the Confessions. Uh, but uh, I'll try to explain to you. It, it's nothing super difficult or technical. So in the Lutheran Confessions, they write that in the first place we teach concerning those who contract matrimony, that is, get, get married, that it, it is lawful for all who are not suited for celibacy to marry. This is a command of God, because of fornication let every man have, have his own wife. Nor is it the command only but, but God's creation and institution also compel those to marry who are not accepted by a singular work of God. This according to Genesis 2.18. So what the confessions basically do is that they take two Bible passages, one from 1 Corinthians and one, one from, from Genesis 2, and then they say that based on these, if you feel sexual lust or temptation, or at least it seems like that, that if you feel sexual lust or temptation, then you really have to marry. Then that's what, what it is seem. And um, I, think, I think it's important, and this is how I explain it to myself, that to remember that in this context, the case is that the Lutherans there are confessing against the Romans or Papists, those who follow the Pope, who claim that anyone can choose never to marry with a good conscience and and then they promise this eternal bound, bounding vow not to marry. So they, 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 first of all, they say that, okay, you just choose and then you will cease to feel any sexual temptation. Well, obviously that doesn't work, right? But, and and then, then also they, they sort of add this, uh, add this binding vow, meaning that, that, that okay, we, we, we say this, we, uh, you, you give this promise and then, no matter how suitable or how good of a spouse comes, then you, you can never marry. And, and this Lutherans don't hold, we don't have any bounding vows. That you, you can choose to live celibate, but, but that, that's not no, any kind of eternal choice. That it, it's just a choice for the moment that you, you keep going. And then if, if, if at some point a suitable wife or husband comes along, you, you are free to marry. Okay, so I, I wouldn't say that the confessions say precisely that, that, or exactly that you, you, have, to, you have to marry. Uh, to, have, to want to have sex, is a, it's a really good reason to get married, but it can't be the only reason. This is why the church never forced uh, children or 12, 13 year olds who just gone through puberty to marry. Uh, there has to be a consent and a willingness because it, it's a choice. You choose to love another person. You choose to sacrifice yourself for the other person. And he chooses the same for you. So it, it, it can't be about just that do you, do you want, want his body. It has to be that do you want his or her body. It, it has to be that do you want to live with it, this person. Also, practical experience, as I already mentioned, demonstrates that marriage is difficult enough when both want it. I cannot imagine what it is when one does not want to be in the relationship in the first place. And it has to be so terribly difficult, that kind of marriage. And to ma get married is always a risk, perhaps the biggest risk you will ever take, and that's fine, but it doesn't mean that you should enter enter into it without any kind of consideration and thought. Okay. And also, if someone is wondering that you feel like you really do not want to marry a person, that is a good reason not to marry a person. You don't need to justify it in any other way. If you, if you just feel like, okay, I don't want to live with that, that that's fine. That's fine. 
Because once you, once you marry and make the commitment, then you're supposed to stay there, no matter what you feel or not feel. But before that, you're very free, and, and it's very smart of you to use your intuition, because your intuition is sort of looking out for you. It's saying that, hey, this, if you feel at peace and you feel happy with someone and it's nice together, it was like I was in a wedding and the father kept saying that we had such a nice time when you were a kid. And he said it like 20 times in the, in the speech. And I was thinking that he, he, was, he was listening to his intuition. That he, his intuition was saying that, oh, it's safe, it's pleasant, it's fun, I can be here. This is a good place for me. And, but if the intuition is saying that, oh, this is so boring, or I'm feeling, I, I, I just want to get out of here, or, or, or I have to always struggle to find something to say, or, or, or uh, I don't know what, what else it could be saying, then, then it usually tends to be a sign of that, that no matter how good looking, or how smart, or how Christian, or pious, or I don't know, good choice according to your mom, or your best friends, that guy is, He's not probably the best husband material ever. That, 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 and so it, it is worth it to listen, listen to that and, and to keep, keep that also in mind. I'd, it can't be, again, the only reason, but it, it should be something that you should pay attention to. Okay, so you don't have to get married. That was what I was saying. Okay, then I have something here about the commandments. I thought that we could talk about it a little bit. Do you have any questions at this point? Any or comments? It would be really nice to hear something if you have. Yeah. Nothing? Okay. That's fine. Uh, I want to read you, read something. I'm going to read you a story. I really like this story. Uh, has to do with the Sixth Commandment. Uh, I think usually you, you basically probably know, know where I stand, you know where most Lutherans stand with, um, with, 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 with porn and masturbation. That, that, that's, that's a no. And, and it, it's a little bit lame to say it like that, because everyone has heard it probably many times. But... Um, I think this is a more interesting way. So I'm, I'm going to read from uh, Ted Roberts' book called Pure Desire. Uh, it's not like the best book ever written on the topic, but it is, it is an interesting read uh, for sure, if you have time and energy to read, and, and, and has many, many good points. So he, he, tells, he tells a story in this book, and I, I thought that I would read it to you. There was once a great and noble king whose land was terrorized by a crafty dragon. Like a massive bird of prey, the scaly beast delighted in ravaging villages with his fiery breath. Hapless victim, victims ran from their burning homes, only to be snatched into the dragon's jaws or talons. Those devoured instantly were deemed more fortunate than those carried back to the dragon's lair to be devoured at his le leisure. The king led his sons and knights in many valiant battles against the serpent. Riding alone, alone in the forest, one of the king's sons heard his name peered lo low and soft. In the shadows of the ferns and trees, curled among the boulders, lay the dragon. The creature's heavy-lidded eyes fastened on the sprints, and the re repti reptilian's mouth stretched into a friendly smile. Don't be alarmed, said the dragon, as gray wisps of smoke rose lazily from his nostrils. I am not what your father thinks. What are you then, asked the prince, wearily drawing his sword as he pulled in the reins to keep his fearful horse from bolting. I am pleasure, said the dragon. Ride on me back and you will experience more than you ever imagined. Come now. I have no harmful intentions. I seek a friend, someone to share flights with me. Have you never dreamed of flying, never longed to soar in the clouds? Visions of soaring high above the forested hills drew the prince hesitantly from his horse. The dragon unf unfurled one great webbed wing to serve as a ramp to, the, to his ridged back. 
between the spiny projections, the prince found a secure seat. Then the creature snapped his powerful wings twice and launched them into the sky. The prince, prince's apprehension melted into awe and exhilaration. From then on, he met the dragon often but secretly, for how could he tell his father, brothers or the knights that he had befriended the enemy? The prince felt separate from them all. Their concerns were no longer his concerns. Even when he wasn't with the dragon, he spent less time with those he loved and more time alone. Over time, the skin on the prince's legs became calloused from gripping the ridged back of the dragon, and his hands grew rough and hardened. He, be he began wearing gloves to hide the malady. After many nights of riding, he discovered scales growing on the backs of his hands as well. With dread, he re re realized his fate where, where, he, where he to continue, and so he resolved to return no more to the dragon. But after a fortnight, he again sought out the dragon, having been tortured with desire. And so it transpired many times over. No matter what his deter determination, the prince eventually found himself pulled back as if by the cords of an invisible web. Silently, patiently, the dragon always waited. One cold moonless night, their excursion became a foray against a sleeping village. Torching the thatched roofs with fiery blasts from his nostrils, the dragon roared with delight when the terrified victims fled from their burning homes. Swooping in, the serpent belched again, and flames engulfed a cluster of screaming villagers. The prince closed his eyes tightly in an attempt to shut out the carnage. In the pre-dawn hours, when the prince crept back, kept back, crept back from his dragon trusts, the road outside his father's castle, castle, castle usually remained empty, but not tonight. Terrified refugees streamed into the protective walls of the castle. The prince attempted to slip through the crowd to close himself in his chambers, but some of the survivors stared and pointed toward him. He was there, one woman cried out. I saw him on the back of the dragon. Others nodded their heads in angry agreement. Horrified, the prince saw that the, his father, the king, was in the courtyard holding a bleeding child in his arms. The king's face mirrored the agony of his people as his eyes found the princess. The son fled, hoping to escape into the night, but the guards apprehended him as if he were a common thief. He brought him to the great hall where his father sat solemnly on the throne, the people on every side railed against the prince. Banish him, he heard one of his own brothers angrily cry out. Burn him alive, other voices shouted. As the king rose from his throne, blood stains from the wounded shone darkly on his royal robes. The crowd fell silently in expectation of his degree, decree. The prince, who could not bear to look into his father's face, stared at the flagstone, flagstones of the floor. Take off your glo gloves and your tunic, the king commanded. The prince obeyed slowly, dreading to have his metamorphosis uncovered before the kingdom. Was his shame not already great enough? He had hoped for a quick death without further humiliation. Sounds of revol revulsion rippled through the crowd at the sight of the prince's thick, scaled skin and the ridge growing along his spine. The king strode towards his son, and the prince steeled himself, fully expecting a backhanded blow, even though he had never been struck so by his father. Instead, his father embraced him and wept as he held him tightly. In shocked disbelief, the prince buried his face against his father's shoulder. Do you wish to be freed from the dragon, my son? The prince answered in despair, I wished it many times, but there is no hope for me. Not alone, said the king. You cannot win against the serpent alone. Father, sobbed the prince, I am no longer your son, I am half beast. But his father replied, My blood runs in your veins. My nobility has always been stamped deep within your soul. With his face still hidden, tearful in his father's embrace, the prince heard the king instruct the crowd. The dragon is crafty. Some fall victim to his wiles and some to his violence. There will be mercy for all, mercy for all who wish to be freed. Who else among you has ridden the dragon? The prince lifted his head to see someone emerge from the crowd. To his amazement, he recognized an older brother, one who had been lauded throughout the kingdom for his onslaught against the dragon in battle 
and for his many good deeds. Others came, some weeping, others hanging their heads in shame. The king, the king embraced them all. This is our most powerful weapon against the dragon, he announced. Truth, no more hidden flights, alone we cannot resist him. I think this is a pretty powerful story. I know I feel a little bit like an old old man reading to his grandchildren, but <laughs> but 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 I I I think I think most of most um, most of you or many of you probably recognize yourself in this, and um, and I, I just I, I want to say that first of all there is hope, and second of all, if you are struggling with these kinds of things that have to do with porn or masturbation, those kinds of things, don't struggle alone. It, it's just, it, 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 it is really, really difficult to do it alone. Uh, it's much better to form some sort of group and, and think together with other people of the same sex uh, about the situation and, and what you can do. And if you, if you want to have an honest and open discussion, you can come and talk with me. I'm, 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 I, I've been a, a pastor for young adults for so long that I'm, I'm quite used to talking about this. You don't have to feel embarrassed, uh, embarrassed about, about that, that I, I've seen, seen many, many things before. Uh, and it's not as uncommon as you think. So again, the statistics say that at least 65% of Christian men and uh, between 30 and 40 percent of Christian women have struggled with this during the last year. And, and, and with men, this is kind of a cautious estimation. I, I've seen estimates that go up to 90 percent. So it, it, you're not the only one, just, just so you know. And uh, I, I wanted to say, say, say it out loud. Uh, I'm also going to mention, since we have time and Nobody. Do you have questions about this? I'm, I'm guessing that not, probably not about this at least. But the author, it, it's Ted Ro Roberts, Pure, Pure Desire. Uh, uh, I'm going to also mention the, the ninth and tenth commandment because I think that's another one that many of us struggle with. Uh, I, I, I've also been, been through this and, and that I'm, I'm talking about the sin of comparison, and I, I think that's a really, really big one. That people tend to, especially when they look at social media, uh, especially when they think about their life, they, they tend to think, and, and we tend to think, that I wish I had that what he or she has. And, and our, our, our life becomes this constant comparison game of, he found someone when he was 25, or he got a PhD when he was 30, or she has already two kids and she's the same, she's younger than me, or uh, he or she has this kind of family, and, and so forth. And it just it goes. And I, I just want to say that if you really want to ruin, ruin your life, like make yourself really miserable, then practice this. <laughs> this is like, this is the. This is best advice. So if you if you want to feel like totally miserable and, and pissed off all the time, pra practice comparing yourself to anyone and everyone, and, and always thinking that I want that what he or she has. It, 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 it truly like can 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 make you feel like so disappointed in, in God and in yourself and in, in everything. And I, I would say that a better way to think about this is is or what, this is what I do. So when, when these thoughts come to my mind, it might, let's say, we can take Samuli, for example. Samuli Sika Virta, who's a good friend and so, so, uh, of mine. And, 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 and so he, 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 got, he got the call to be a professor now. And, and for me, as someone who's doing a PhD, I, I could very well, this might be a sort of typical way for me to think that I could think that, well, oh, Samuel is one month younger than me, and I haven't even finished my PhD, and he's already becoming the professor. So that's very typical. So what, what, what I do in my mind is that, that uh, first of all, or when I notice that I, I, I'm going to put this here. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, so 
what, what I do in my mind is that when I notice that I'm comparing myself with, with him or with anyone else, Oh, but this is good. No, this, we get. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So wh what I what I notice is that when I notice these kinds of thoughts with him or someone else, first of all is that I I repent in my own mind. I I say that God, I'm sorry for comparing myself with with him or someone else. And and then then the second one which I practice is that I actually pray for that person. So I bless him, and I say that, that God, I pray that you would bless him, let's say, again, if it would be Samuli, that I, I pray that you would let him be as successful as a professor as possible, and, and bless him in all his ventures in America, and let him have new friends, and let him publish many articles and books and so forth. I, I, I luckily, I, I don't have big ambitions to become prof a professor, so I'm, 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 I'm in that sense fine, I haven't compared myself in, in, in this case, but I, in other things I, I, I do tend to do that every once in a while. Um, yeah, and I, I would say that if you struggle, if you, I mean, if you really struggle with this, I, I would actually recommend to sort of think about like fasting from social media every once in a while. Just, just put your Facebook or TikTok or Snapchat or whatever you use. Just don't pause for a couple of months and see. Because I, I, I actually think that, that that's something that feeds this comparison game all the time when you're looking at whatever people are publishing. And, and it's so stupid because you can sort of see, you can see those kinds of people who, you know, they go somewhere and they're into, re, into a restaurant or something, or, or so, they're somewhere and then they make this big smile and take the selfie and, and, then, they, and then they put the camera away and then they look miserable again. It's like, it's not, they're not even having that much fun. Like, and, 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 but, but in our minds, we are making it to be like the greatest thing in the world that they're doing. No comments yet? No? no. Okay. okay, I'll make a comment. Go. I'm figuring out. Yeah. I don't know what, how I could put this in there. But, um, so for me, uh, it's always felt like, like if to be celibate. Yeah. I've always, um, I felt like God has always presented it to me as a possibility since like the eighth grade. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's been like I feel like God's mission and for people and for yeah. me to be in a sexual relationship would be very painful. Mm -hmm. Um and I think some of those like the quotes from Aquinas where it's like describing lust and things, I feel like I would have to be the recipient the recipient of that kind of energy mm -hmm. if I was in a relationship. Yeah. So can you speak to maybe how Relationships and how they should be like getting married doesn't take care of the lust problem because that whole pure desire is really for people who have like fornication that wrecks their like marriages and families. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> hmm. I just think that's an important piece. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, so am I, am I understanding you? Just to make sure that I'm understanding you correctly. So your your sort of saying or asking that, 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 that before you get married, you have a certain amount, or most, of, most people have a certain amount of lust, and, and then, then once they get married, they might be surprised, yeah, they might be surprised that, hey, actually, this is continuing, and, and, and they are still tempted by different kinds of sexual sins. Is, is that what you're... Yeah. You know, and like I haven't seen in Western culture the man having to, you know, rethink about his desires. Okay. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I know very well. Okay, okay, good, good. Yeah, because I haven't seen that either. It makes me very disappointed that, that we are we are not taking more responsibility as men. Uh, and for that yeah. Point, yeah. Yeah. I've had a lot of like repulsion at the idea of being in a marriage because I feel like yeah. I yeah. <laughs> yeah, I understand that, and, and I think it's fair. I think I have to say that I think that's fair, and I, I think, especially if you get married with a sex addict of any kind, then then you you probably will receive 
that, that's a double bind of its own because if he sort of focuses all the energy on, on you as, as wife or, or husband, then, then that means that you, you all the time feel like you're not giving enough or, or, or have, a, and, and then on the other hand side, if he focuses on somewhere else, then he's breaking the marriage, right? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, so what to say about this? Um, well, I think you're on the right track. Um, so there are, uh, it, it is absolutely like that. And I, I think this, this, is, uh, this is equally true for women. But as a man, I'm, I'm going to speak more from, from the perspective of men, uh, because that, that's, that's more also what I've been reading and talking about. Uh, so maybe we'll, we'll start here. So in, in Latin, uh, and I, I, think it's, I think it's a good, good principle, you have two words that sound alike. One is vir, V-I, no, yeah, V-I-R. And then you have virtus, which is V-I-R-T-U-S. And vir means man, and virtus means strength or virtue. Can be, but virtue is maybe a good, good translation for all pr practical purposes. And, uh, and, and so the old Roman idea is that a man is someone who is virtuous, is someone who controls his passions or is somehow in contact with that. And the deceptive idea with, or deceptive thing with addiction is, or any kinds of porn abuse, is that it gives the sort of impression, uh, it, it falsifies your worldview and it distort, distorts it, and it, it gives, gives you the impression that Sex is something that is always available, or women are often always willing, and, and it also gives you, it, it also increases your own desire. So the, the more you consume that kind of material, the harder and, and, and stronger material you want, because you're also, you're, you're not only going in to something, you're also running away from something else. So, so what, 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 what people tend to do that are, are addicts of any kind, but this is equally true with, with porn addiction, is that they, they are running away from something else. And, and, um, and so, so it makes it, it, it sort of, and that, that leads into this sort of cycle where you sort of keep going and going. And often when it comes to Christians, you have this something that someone has called a sort of binge purge cycle, which means that, that you go on a bender and then you repent and cry and then you are without it for a couple of weeks, a month, something, and then you go on, on a bender again. And it keep, keeps going and going and it gets worse all the time. And, and I, I definitely think that it, it has to, it is, it is our responsibility as, as men and, and also yours as women, whoever struggles with it, that, that you have to take responsibility for, for your actions. And a part of that responsibility is, in my mind, and maybe the first and foremost part, is to, to seek support and help from other Christians. That you, you just you can't do it alone. It just doesn't work. Like it, it, it's almost impossible. And I know that it feels, for many of us, it feels embarrassing, and it feels frustrating, and it feels difficult, and it feels all kinds of things, but that, that, that's just how, how it works. And and I think, I think also because of the nature of addiction, it tends to be a much longer road than just simply, oh, I need an accountability partner who checks my phone or something else. But you, you really have to go into very sort of profound, profound um, ways. You have to look at your own history and you have to examine many, many different things that you have done and, and, and many different coping mechanisms that you have. And I'm, 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 in a sense, I'm sorry for all of us because we were born into this age where you have this thing that's around us that's an anonymous mm -hmm. most of the time. It's always available and it's always accessible. You don't have to pay anything. And that, 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 that makes, makes it super, super difficult. And I think, personally, I think we have done a terrible job as a church to give tools to young people and young men. 
again, uh, I didn't say that, but one of, one of the things I, I, I've been lacking is that there is not a single Lutheran book about this topic. There's nothing. There might be some article in some magazine somewhere, but no, no, no books, no courses, no nothing. So, uh, and I, I know there are some reformed courses. Uh, Catholics have done a pretty good job. Uh, you can find, find there, there's a lot of stuff uh, online about it. Uh, there are also many secular websites, uh, secular courses that you can try because they also recognize that this is a problem. And it, 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 so here, here, and what makes it really difficult for theologians is that it's something, something where theology and psychology sort of fuse. And theologians, they don't like that because they, they want to keep doing theology. So the theological answer tends to be that, well, you know, the sixth commandment, and we have confession and absolution, and problem solved. But it's not. Everyone who's knows, who has been a pastor knows that same guys keep calling every two weeks or every month, always the same thing, year after year. Many of them married again, again, again. So I think we have to start to do something else and, and we, have, we have to speak up and be bolder. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't say. Well, do you have any, any more questions, clarifying ideas? I, I, really, I, I, I really love your comment. That, that's a really good one. But, uh, did I answer your question at all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, go ahead first. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then miss completely what we do have. And you talked yeah. about, like, for example, you can be a really good uncle. Yeah. Or a really good aunt. Yeah. Uh, nieces and nephews when yeah. you're not married. Um, and I think one thing that seems to be really minimized, um, I don't want to say love the same line, is friendship. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like there's, like, in our, in our culture, and I'm looking for her in particular, I'm thinking about, um, like, friendship is, like, exists, but it's just not the same as mm-hmm. having a boyfriend or a girlfriend mm-hmm. or a best friend. It's just like you bitch. It's mm. like, or it's kind of important, but it's not the same mm. as going for. Mm. And I think we have built our communities entirely in the family unit rather than having larger communities. And I don't like how it was in the past, and I don't like mm. history. But I do know families are very social, and we need community, and, and different people have different levels of what they need. And to live alone sounds very dramatic, you know, no offense, but sounds very dramatic and, and depressing. Yeah. And like, but to have a community around you, whether that's have a spouse you've been married to or not, I think is really essential. And so I think when you when you haven't, the Lord hasn't opened the doors for you to have um, uh, uh, someone to marry yet, or maybe never, um, you should look around and see who needs a friend, um, or who who in my family needs somebody who to, to like really come in and like be the best man ever for that kid. Like there's so many opportunities for. Um, community and for connection with humans you need. You can't just be like a hermit and isolate and like that turns bad every time that people do that. Um, so rather rather than having such a, a hard or focus um, with a lot of pressures, a lot of things around in our society pressure us to do is have a hardcore focus on like building a family of your own living. Look around and see what other kinds of people around you can be your family who need you to be their their for, or who need you to be their family. And it's beautiful when you start to do that. It's yeah. really cool. And you, you don't have to be lonely. It's not just sad. It's not <laughs> just sad. There's so many people who need love. Mm. And they're not just the person who you're going to, you know, build, build a life with. And it took me many years to, to realize this. And it's a, a big gift that yeah. God has given me yeah. to, to see that. And there are so many people. They're all around and out there who need your love, and you might not marry them. And that's, mm. that's good, mm. that's okay. Mm. Yeah, I love that. I love that. No, no, that's really good. What, what you're doing is that you're sort of reframing it and doing something positive. You're ma- making something that most would consider an imped- impediment to an as- asset, which is awesome. Yeah, good job. Yes, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You can find amazing uncles and aunts and uh, 
and also uh, I, I know this is not a solution for everyone, but meeting even consider we live together. Yeah. Mm. Because uh, a family doesn't have to be just uh, people to make it here. Yeah. And uh, speaking about uh, support issue, uh, I think uh, that the main problem uh, which is concerning uh, for us here is that uh, it's sort of teaches you to see for your own circle. And uh, I think that's the opposite of love. Mm. And uh, it sticks between marriage sources is all about love. Mm. It has nothing to do with love. Mm. And uh, it's all about uh, seeking for like food for your spouse. Mm -hmm. And you can have husband and wife are seeing each other mm -hmm. to each other. I'm, I'm giving my own to my husband now, he's doing his own to me. And uh, that's the very opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, I, I, I agree. Th thank you. Yes, go ahead. Um, in the context of, uh, of the fight as a uh, human being, a uh, social being, yes. and, uh, and the statistics that you mentioned that 60% of extinct population is living alone, mm -hmm. which I assume also means that roughly 50% of your congregation uh, are people who live alone. Yes. Do you think that there is a room for some sort of the renaissance of monastic life in Christian? Well, I I think it's worth a try. Not not probably. We would maybe talk about mod modified monasteries. Sure. I so so so, so yeah, 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 yeah 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 yeah. But yeah. So I, I can if I can think out loud. I, I haven't developed that. This is not a hardcore statement. It's just like. This is what comes to mind when I think about it. So, what I think the big problem with, with monasteries was, as Dr. Bierman was yesterday speaking, it was sort of twofold. One problem with it is that, that people tend to think that those who are in monastery are way more higher up than everyone else in society. They are serving God much better than the normal people that are married. And the other problem is that they isolate themselves from the world. But if you could have some kind of community where, let's say, and I've, I've often thought about this because I used to have, so I, I, where I came from, there was many of these, a little bit older, they were like super old, but in their maybe 50s, 60s, from when I was 30, 30 they seemed old. Now, now they're seeming a little bit younger, but, 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 but they were about 60 years old and they were these women who were alone. And, and I thought to myself often that, Man, would that be nice if they could move in together and take care of each other and pray together and, and live, you know, in the middle, middle of the city because they always feel like they want to talk with someone. And, and, and I, I think it's not for everyone. Some, some really want to be alone and some can handle it. But, but as, as I think you mentioned there, that, that, that the fact that you don't want to get married does not mean that you... you or the fact that you're single doesn't mean that you're not social. So you, you really need that social environment. And in that sense, that I think would be really good. That, 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 that. So I'm, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm all for it if someone wants to try it. I wouldn't maybe move in with the opposite sex because that, that tends to create all kinds of tensions. But, but, but people from the same sex, why, why not? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I, I would say in my, my world, how I view celibacy, I, I don't view it sort of in that sense that, that it's, um, 
I'm going to say like this, that someone, you don't have to be a virgin to be a celibate. Meaning that, 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 that if you, something like that has happened, or, or, uh, or, or you've strayed in your youth uh, and had, had sex, it, it, and I think, or, or you, you are divorced, for example. I think you could, or widowed, you, you could decide that I'm, I'm going to now live for God, and, and that's what I call a celibate life. And then, and then maybe, maybe I would then sort of think that then, then you maybe you wouldn't call yourself a virgin anymore because, because that, that's not technically, or that's not true. But you can, you can be celibate, that it's more like the state, state of ac- active being and, and what, you, what you want to do. Does this make sense? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Uh, the comment about friendship made me think to the discussion group we had earlier about technology. It's a good discussion group. I recommend it for everyone. But it was about uh, one of the points was that technology like media and transportation has made it easier to have a large group of people that you're acquainted with and then you can easily drop the relationships that are hard and continue with the mm. I think there is some wisdom to that, for sure. Then the the thing with friendship is is in general like that that it um, it has to be so, somehow like based of, of, on mutual understanding and respect. That if you lose that, then then it might be very difficult. And in the same way as in marriage. That, that, that I would say that, because I, I don't know, some people are hold to this, that, that you, you should stay together no matter what. Uh, I, I don't think that's the case. But if your husband, for, for example, assaults you physically or, or, or you know, does something crazy or, or your wife is, is, is completely mad psychologically, I'm not saying to divorce, but I'm, I'm saying that I don't know if I view it as a terrible wrong to, for example, live in separate addresses after that. So uh, as long as as long as there is, like with friendships, I, I would say that as long as you have this basis of mutual respect and understanding, then then probably yes, go through difficult times by all means, but 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 not not at all costs. That, that's maybe what, what comes to my mind. Okay, I have to let you go, but thank you so much for coming. It's, it's funny.